Welcome to the ACC Imaging Section Pericard Disease Education Webinar. Uh, my name is Dr. Alan Klein from the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, we have a very exciting program on pericardial disease and multimodality imaging. Uh, in terms of the format, we have a um, didactic lecture followed by three cases with interesting discussion by the panel. Uh, my co-moderator is Dr. Aldo Shinoni, who is Director of Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy a program at Montefiore Hospital in New York. And I have my panelists. Uh, we have Antonio Abate, uh, uh, who is the Ruth Heed Professor of Cardiology at UVA School of Medicine. Uh, we have uh, Michael Tong, Surgical Director of Heart Transplant uh, at Cleveland Clinic. Uh, Paul Kramer, who is the uh, Associate Director of Cardiovascular Training Program and works with me in the Pericardial Center Cleveland Clinic. Uh, and we have Brittany Weber, who's the director of the cardio oncology, excuse me, cardio rheumatology clinic, and cardiology, cardiovascular imaging, and Brigham and Women's in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, case presenters: We have Michael uh, Chatrit uh, from McGill University. He's the director of the amyloid dosis project at McGill and uh, clinical director of the MRI program. Uh, Dr. Tom Wang, who's a staff cardiologist uh, at Cleveland Clinic. Associate Professor, and finally we have Sneha Vakamudi, who's the Director of Structural Imaging um, at Ascension Texas Curvassar, and Assistant Professor, University of Texas. So very exciting uh, program, great lectures, and I'm going to turn, uh, turn it over to my uh, co-moderator, Dr. Aldo Shinoni. Um, thank you, Dr. Klein, for, for, um, for kind of arranging these and uh, you know, coordinating all these and letting me participate. Uh, this is a kind of an exciting webinar, and you know, especially among friends, colleagues, and mentors. Um, so let me just uh, share my screen uh, so we can get on directly. So for the for the next um, 15 minutes, um, I'll try to summarize um, kind of the key concepts of uh, multimodality imaging of pericardial diseases, and and uh, by no means this is. A is you know supposed to be a very extensive review of the literature, but rather just serve as a foundation to open up the discussion with the clinical cases. So let's open up with um, you know a couple of uh, cases that uh, I think will kind of open up the discussion. I think we have three cases here on the screen. So we have the first case uh, on the left is a uh, 50 year, uh, years old uh, male with late presenting macrolide infarction, uh, and there was some plan for angiogram, and we can see that there's kind of an effusion, although a little complex. Um, case two is a, is a 20 uh, eight, eight years old female with uh, recent viral pericarditis, who basically completed her entire regimen, and now is coming back with this concern of uh, you know discomfort uh, in the chest. And this is kind of her echo. Uh, we can see a little bit of an effusion there. Um, and then uh, case three is, is a 70 years old male with remote uh, bypass surgery, but also had a recent ablation uh, for atrial fibrillation, who comes with this kind of acute and chronic uh, uh, onset of dyspnea and, and leg edema. And we can see here that there's you know, abnormal septal motion with uh, bounce and, and, and potential respiratory phasic shift. So the question here is, do we need more imaging? And, and we're going to try to answer that question uh, to the lecture. So these are kind of the objective. Uh, we'll review some of the key uh, anatomopathological concepts of the pericardium and then describe the role of imaging in, in, the, in the following um, you know, disease, which is pretty much effusion pericarditis and contributor pericarditis. So before we get deep into the imaging, I think it's important to understand the anatomy of the pericardium because that's very useful to understand uh, why we see what we see. Uh, uh, I think the first thing is to describe the pericardium and understand that there's two layers. Uh, the, the parietal pericardium, uh, which is composed of epicardial fat. You have the fibrosa in the middle, and they have, you have a, a parietal serosa, which is kind of uh, covers uh, the inner side. Um, and, um, and then we have an epicardium, or the visceral pericardium, which is basically a monolayer uh, of visceral serosa. And in between these two layers is that where we have the, the virtual pericardial space that uh, kind of expand in the, in the presence of uh, pericardial effusion. The, the important concept here is that, first of all, the pericardium is very thin, and, and it measures, based on and, uh, you know, pathology 
the specimen, as you can see here on the left, is just one to two millimeters or less. So when we look at the percardium in, in imaging, it's actually paper, paper thin. So it's very thin. So any significant thickening will be easily detected. The second thing is that uh, the percardium is a vascular. So it doesn't have a robust, you know, uh, vascularization. So normal percardium should not enhance uh, and on, on imaging when we, decon we do contrast. The, the final concept is that, you know, although we have two layers and for the most part they are kind of together with minimal uh, or physiological uh, fluid, um, you know, when we have an inflammation of the pericardium, for the most part we can have involvement of two, the two uh, layers, but there are some occasions in, with, in which the visceral pericardium is, is, is predominantly involved and, and, and uh, such as the case is effusive, uh, uh, effusive contraction, uh, in which, um, you know, if this need for surgery, it becomes a very significant challenge to rip off uh, the serosa out of the myocardium. So the second thing that's important to review is, is how the pericardium responds to injury as it relates to imaging. Uh, as you can see here, we have all the way to the left a normal pericardium uh, in pathology. And as injury occurs, we can see that the first thing that happens is an increase in, in thickness of the pericardium. We can see that in these really uh, red dots is just uh, evidence of, you know, incipient neovascularization and the formation of vessels. And there's infl infiltration with, uh, you know, mononuclear cells. So how that relates to imaging? Well, I mean, we're going to see that the pericardium might be thickened. Uh, we can see evidence of pericardial edema with uh, inflammatory cells that can be detected by either FTG on, on rather nuclear imaging or based on T2-weighted imaging on MRI. Um, now that we have vessels in the pericardium, so the gadolinium can penetrate into the pericardium and hang into uh, the tissue uh, of the pericardium, we can have an enhancement. And this is kind of the foundation uh, uh, for the, you know, enhancement that we see with legal enum enhancement in MRI. As the injury continues, then we, we progress to a more kind of, uh, you know, subacute phase in which there's a lot of granulation tissue and, 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 you know, really, really robust neovascularization that kind of really enhances or, or, or kind of establish uh, uh, the enhancement that we see uh, uh, with legal enum enhancement. In some occasions when you have a very robust, you know, neovascularization, you can even see enhancement with, with the iodine and, and, and cardiac CT. At this perpetration of the injury, uh, um, you know, the pericardium might, might heal, but might heal with either fibrosis or, or calcification. And in those cases, we can see that the pericardium remains uh, thick uh, uh, with dense fibrosis and, and calcifications. And, and uh, the majority of the neovascular might disappear, although there might be, you know, a, a few uh, you know, uh, vessels that remain. And what we can see here in imaging is basically a thickened pericardium and, and uh, calcification. And, and typically you see uh, no to minimal uh, NLG, LG. And I think that's kind of the spectrum or the, the kind of natural history of the injury uh, of the pericardium. So when we talk about diseases of the pericardium, there are many. And, and I think, as you can see, in, for, the, the, for this uh, particular lecture, we're going to focus on these three, which are, you know, of course, the most common. Um, so when we talk about you know, pericardial effusion, um, I think it's, it's important, and, and we all recognize that uh, pericardial effusion, uh, you know, uh, the first-line imaging to evaluate an effusion is, is echocardiography. But I think every time we have the opportunity to evaluate an effusion with echocardiography, we have to go beyond just the detection and the sizing, but also try to characterize it and, and try to ascertain if there's any obvious, uh, you know, cause. And that's, that's very helpful for management. As you can see here in panel A, it's just, you know, as this kind of anechoic effusion, perhaps, you know, kind of small to moderate size, uh, and, um, you know, um, that, um, you know, given the look and the anechoic, uh, might suggest that may maybe this is kind of more of a transsudative effusion, although this has to be correlated uh, with the clinical presentation. But if you compare that to case B, and we can see that that effusion is, is no longer that anechoic uh, uh, in terms of appearance, it's, it's kind of a little echogenic. And, and you can see, you get the impression that maybe the, the pericardial layers may be stuck uh, you know, along with the effusion. Uh, and this is a case that you will be suspicious for, like more of a complex exudative effusion and perhaps an inflammatory one. Um, uh, case C, you can clearly see this is a case that presented uh, at the beginning of the, of, the, of the lecture that you're, you know, very worried for, you know, an infarct. And, and as you can see here, that this, this kind of echo-dense material within the pericardium in continuity with the uh, infarct zone uh, uh, along with uh, kind of a less dense effusion around it that is rising the suspicion for a contained rupture. 
And, and finally, this is a patient that was, you know, uh, imaged in the in the cath lab uh, after the compensate uh, the compensation, you know, when uh, CTO was tried to intervene. Uh, and we can see that up an injection of, of uh, uh, you know, echo and enhancing agents. You can see that there's actually extravasation. And this is another uh, uh, tool that we have in the toolkit uh, to evaluate patients with an effusion just beyond detection and sizing. But in, in, is, that's not all. And I think it's important to also kind of evaluate for complication. And, and, and although, uh, you know, it's easy to kind of focus attention on the tamponade side of things, and, and this is a very typical case of, of tamponade, uh, and, and we can see a very large effusion with, you know, riventricular uh, collapse, uh, um, you know, is is with with you know uh, you know platonic IVC that doesn't collab with uh, you know respiratory and or valsalva effort. Um, but it's also or it's similarly important that after these patients uh, are tapped and we follow them up to see a recurrence of diffusion right after the pericardiosynthesis, that we analyze for the presence of you know effusive constrictive physiology that be very relevant and might be treatable. And then this is a case that was tapped, and we can see that you know, the septum uh, is kind of uh, uh, exhibit a presence of septal bounds and, and even respirophasic uh, shift, suggesting that there's a uh, presence of effusive contrastive physiology uh, in this patient. And that's kind of very, very important. So when do we use advanced imaging for effusion? Well, you know, um, in any case that we have an equivocal diagnosis, uh, particularly post-surgical, um, when there's a complex uh, presentation or we're thinking about like specific cause, like in case number one that we presented at the beginning that, you know, we were concerned for, uh, you know, contained rupture, uh, this patient was, you know, uh, you know, often the, you know, given the, the conservation and the, the concern for, for rupture was sent for cardiac CT. So the, the, the first thing that uh, we identified was that, you know, the, the, there's, you know, faint enhancement of the pericardium that suggests to some degree of inflammation. Uh, um, the, the second thing is that the density of the effusion is actually increasing, it's close to 50, suggesting that this might be kind of indeed a hemorrhagic, uh, you know, uh, effusion or bloody effusion. Uh, but more importantly, uh, you know, when you uh, did, uh, you know, evaluating in the area of the infarct, and you can focus your attention here in the red circle, you can see this serpiginous tract uh, with evidence of actually, uh, you know, uh, contract extravasation into the pericardium with, you know, overlaying uh, thrombus. Uh, which has confirmed uh, the concern. And I think this is important because this would change entirely the management of this patient. And if this patient was just kind of, you know, right there, you know, uh, you know, uh, cardiothoracic surgery was kind of consulted right away for uh, to kind of fix all, uh, the coronaries, but also try to kind of, uh, you know, take care of this, uh, you know, contempt rupture as well. And the bonus finding of CT is that we were able to kind of identify already where were like, you know, the potential, you know, areas of, of uh, coronary stenosis. In this case was, you know, a CTO, subtotal uh, occlusion of the LAD, and then a gluteal cirque, which was expected uh, for the territory. You know, and this is kind of, again, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, more cases that highlight uh, how CT can be useful. And we can have here a chart on the right where you can use the density to try to approximate uh, what type of effusion are you dealing with, and, 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 and you know, in consequence, try to identify what's the cause by looking at the, the, the uh, fluid characteristics. But also, you can, uh, you know, uh, address or identify potential causes, like, again, this is another contained rupture, and, and this is like a, you know, penetrating trauma uh, with, uh, you know, uh, bloody effusion and some degree of privatization of contrast. So now, now moving moving gears a little into pericarditis is, is the question is is when imaging is needed and, and, and you know uh, to make the diagnosis of pericarditis there's a well set criteria and, and you need to meet two of those four uh, typical chest pain rub you know ECG changes you can see down here and the presence of a new worsening pericardial effusion um, um, you know. Uh, in, in, the inflammatory markers are used as a confirmatory or supported finding, and, and there's like, you know, there's great uh, excitement and, and support for the use of LGE as a either supportive or even, you know, confirmatory finding in, in, in cases with pericarditis. Uh, I think it's like with, you know, in reality, uh, you know, uh, although many cases present like a typical pericarditis, there's quite a few that the, the diagnosis remain kind of equivocal, and we're not sure if it's, this is indeed, you know, pericarditis. And that's when imaging might come into, 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 into place to help in addition to a few other indications. So the first thing is to say that echocardiogram is, is indicated in all, in all patients uh, that were thinking pericarditis. 
first because uh, there's uh, one of the criteria is the presence of a new worsening in the fusion, but also you want to be looking for the presence of constrictive physiology that could be complicating uh, the presentation. Um, and, you know, advanced imaging, uh, I think, you know, is indicated or could be considered when the diagnosis is equivocal uh, in either acute or more important recurrent, which is sometimes it's very difficult to understand if or know if the patient symptoms are really related to the presence of recurrent pericarditis or has, you know, to do with, uh, you know, it's related to something different. Uh, when you have complex presentations and you're searching for specific causes, like you're thinking this is probably malignant pericarditis, um, when you treat the patient but the patient is not responding as it should, uh, I think this is a great opportunity to understand better, uh, um, you know, um, what's going on and what's the degree of, of, of or the burden of pericarditis and why the patient might not be responding. And, and, and you know, there is, uh, you know, an evolving, you know, uh, uh, push to try to use imaging to actually guide the length and the de-escalation of therapy as, you know, with everything in medicine, nothing is, you know, universal. I mean, you know, I think we need to personalize the treatment and, and this might be one that we can use imaging to do that. So this is what we see, you know, in, in pericarditis, uh, you know, and with MRI and that helps confirm the diagnosis. We can see, you know, uh, in T2, T1 weighted imaging can increase, you know, pericardial thickness that looks kind of very diffuse bordering and kind of inflammatory looking. Um, when you look at T2 weighted and LGE, we can see that in the first case, which we tend to call hyperacute acute, we see a combination of both increased enhancement uh, on LGE that is accompanied by the presence of increased signal in T2, which is signals uh, the presence of edema and inflammation. Um, and then the other a potential presentation is in the case of uh, a subacute, uh, you know, pericarditis acute, you know, uh, which is later into the process in which, you know, the, the, the presence of uh, T2 signal or edema is not as evident or it is not uh, visualized, but uh, we still see the presence of, you know, uh, significant uh, enhancement of LGE, which again uh, correlates with the presence of neovascularization as we discussed early on. Um, you know, another feature that you can look into is just the presence of adhesions, you know, effusion, and of course, look for constrictive physiology uh, there. Uh, this is case number two, uh, you know, and uh, which is basically was the, the, the lady who presented with, you know, recurrent symptoms after, you know, stopping the, uh, the treatment, which, by the way, was, you know, a, a full treatment based on what guidelines suggest, and, and uh, there was concern that this is, was, in fact, a recurrent. But, um, you know, what we can see here is that on, on the, uh, you know, uh, MRI, we can see that there's definitely an effusion. We can see that there's, you know, uh, still there's enhancement uh, on the pericardium on the LGE, suggesting of presence of inflammation, and, and there's some degree of edema based in T2-weighted imaging. And, and, and the question that kind of I pose here is that, is this really, uh, 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 you know, a treatment failure, or is rather a kind of premature discontinuation of the therapy? given that as, as the patients still have this degree of, of inflammation despite, treat, you know, full treatment, maybe was not enough. And, and this is basically, uh, uh, you know, premature discontinuation. And, and we can use imaging to decide when to and how appropriately taper uh, uh, the, the therapies. But, you know, MRI and the use of LDE can also be used to kind of predict perhaps how long you could treat. Uh, and maybe kind of guide the, the de-escalation, and, and that's basically based on the burden. I mean, maybe someone who has, you know, more of a mild, you know, enhancement, uh, as we see here on the far left, maybe it will be more suitable for three months, perhaps, uh, uh, while someone who has kind of very intense circumferential, and what Dr. Klein usually refers to as a rip kind of pericarditis, might need a, a little longer treatment or more careful de-escalation. And, and there's evidence that, you know, the, the burden of LGE as a as, as way of, you know, uh, quantifying uh, uh, the LGE um, and on MRI can be, uh, can some, that something could be kind of of help. Um, I mean, this is typically, you know, applied to kind of traditional therapies. I mean, you know, it, it's kind of, you know, so uncertain if this still supply for more, some of the more advanced therapies. So scarcity team pericarditis is usually reserved for more special cases. Uh, you know, usually, usually there's a contraindication or insurance to cardiac MRI, or there's concern for like, you know, iatrogenic pericarditis instead of some sort of procedure in which CT can really detect if there's, there's uh, you know, any, any perforation or lead that is kind of rubbing against the pericardium. Uh, 
um, you know, um, uh, usually uh, CT can also be used to look for, you know, a presence of inflammation by uh, by means of looking at the enhancement after contrast, and, uh, contrast administration. And we can see a case here. You can see a very significant enhancement after the administration of contrast. And, and this is a patient that had like a, you know, micro, you know, a, a, a TV kind of pericarditis. So FDG is a little less used. Uh, it has to be. It has to follow all the preparation that we usually do for 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 patients that are going to go for like you know quote unquote sarcoid uh, you know PET. Uh, but you know um, there's there's a lot of interest in trying to see if it can harness uh, the sensitivity and the power of this imaging modality to assess inflammation and and, and guide and perhaps assess a response to therapy uh, uh, with PET FDG. So now moving into constrictive pericarditis, uh, you know, and um, this is a very challenging diagnosis. Um, uh, as you can see here, it's not enough just to secure the diagnosis, but also which is hard enough to begin with. But I think it's important that we characterize the type of, of uh, pericarditis. Um, and as we can see here, we can have the entire spectrum all the way from, you know, a predominantly inflammatory uh, process with uh, transient constriction uh, all the way to really calcific and burnt out uh, pericardium. So uh, the management is going to be based or is going to be guided by in, uh, if you have and, and what type you have. And I think imaging is very good at, at helping with this. I think that the, the role of imaging multimodality in constrictive pericarditis is threefold. Uh, once you have a patient that you're worried about uh, constriction, I think it's important that we secure the diagnosis. Uh, uh, we ascertain the signs of pericardial inflammation. Uh, and, and three, uh, assess if there's any pericardial adhesion or calcification, particularly if you're going to go for a potential pericardectomy. Um, and, and here, these are the different modalities that can help you with that. And of course, all this assessment has to be done in, 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 you know, um, in addition to clinical and then inflammatory biomarkers. Um, so ECHO, is, as, as with many of the conditions, is the first line, uh, and, and, you know, it's important to mention that it has to be done with a rest parameter. You need to follow a particular protocol, um, and, and this is kind of the, the suggested algorithm that we follow in which we look into mitral inflow and an IVC, uh, and, and that kind of uh, is, is met, as we can see here in, in these couple of pictures, a very platonic IVC with a, a high uh, E to A ratio. Uh, then you go to the next step, which is look for a ventricular septal motion and, and uh, with respiration, which I can, here we can see not only that, but just uh, septal bounce, and that can be confirmed with uh, presence, you know, with the use of M mode. Um, if that's kind of a yes, you proceed and you look into uh, basically tissue Doppler, and, and if you see that the medial annulus uh, move quite well, more than 8 centimeters per second, as it was in this case, uh, you basically are in the presence of constricted, uh, you know, pericarditis. There are additional findings uh, that you can look at, which is basically the annulus reverses, which is you have a septal uh, velocity which is higher than the lagar, which is in, in contrary to what, you know, what the normal is. Um, and then the presence of enhanced, uh, you know, A reversal with uh, expiration, as we can see here, as the patient expire here, then you see a kind of an enhancement in the reversal uh, in the hepatic veins. So, you know, the, the thing is we have already like tools that can be uh, used and, and, you know, kind of in your phone. So that's, that becomes very easy. And this comes with a very, uh, you know, a decent, if not high, you know, sensitivity and specificity. But the question is, once I get my echocardiogram, then when do I add imaging and how that helps? Well, I think, you know, adding advanced imaging in constrictive progress is important when the diagnosis of, uh, you know, uh, the constriction is established, but the question is, there's inflammation here that might be playing a role, and then we need to treat with anti-inflammatory therapies rather than sending the patient for pericardectomy. And that's what, you know, advanced imaging, uh, it becomes very useful, again, in addition to clinical assessment and inflammatory biomarkers. Uh, the second scenario is that in those patients that you are concerned, you're highly suspicious for uh, constriction, but the echo is not quite definitive. And in those cases, MRI can be very useful. Uh, and, and, and sometimes that can be, depending on the, how challenging the case is, might, that might be, uh, you know, again, complemented by invasive hemodynamics. Um, so these are kind of some of the features you can see. You can see adhesion tag imaging. You can see the presence of ventricular interdependence a little easier. 
uh, but similar to what you see in ECHO, uh, you can see that there's increased peripheral thickness here. You can see the, the black line here in between the peripheral fat, uh, you know, and then you can address for the presence of inflammation that, again, uh, could predict reversibility of the constriction uh, in patients that have constriction with very significant LGE and has an increase in inflammatory biomarkers. So here, just to kind of, again, depict that, that case that I presented, case three, uh, and basically they were concerned for constriction, and, and we can, you know, confirm it here, you know, based on the presence of uh, tubular deformation of the ventricles, we can see that there's respiratory of phasic shifts, uh, and, uh, but more importantly, we can see that there's evidence of edema and inflammation, which really help in the management of this patient. And, and this is how it helps. Well, if you have a patient that in which uh, you have the presence of, you know, either uh, T2 signal and, and LGE uh, in the pericardium is suggesting, you know, kind of more of an acute, uh, you know, you know inflammation, uh, or only uh, presence of LGE, which is significant in the more subacute process, that suggests that there's an important inflammatory component to it, and then you will go for anti-inflammatory therapies uh, and, and uh, with follow-up. Uh, in contrast, if you see a patient that has constriction with, you know, overt clinical features of it, and you see that there's non to minimal enhancement and no presence of edema on, on T2 weighted imaging, then I think that's a case that you, you know, might need to consider a, a pericardectomy. So I guess car CT is the role is a little more limited. It can be used for enhancement, uh, as I previously said, um, uh, but uh, I think the, the main role would be in to try to understand calcifications and where they are located in patients that, you know, might need to go for surgery and comes with the added value of, you know, uh, being able to look for the coronaries as a, as a pre-surgical evaluation. Uh, PET, uh, again, for constriction, uh, uh, it can, you know, again, similar to pericarditis, but there's some evidence that you can, perhaps based on the SUB max, uh, try to uh, predict who will be respond to anti-inflammatory anti therapies. However, this is very incipient data and needs kind of further confirmation. Uh, I guess to finalize here, uh, in terms of how I see imaging multimodality driving the care for constriction, uh, con constriction, I think once you secure the diagnosis and you decide if this is a you know an, a transient constriction, a kind of inflammatory constrictions versus a non-inflammatory or more like a chronic burnout uh, constriction. Uh, then you proceed. It's important that, uh, you know, you can use imaging not only to uh, make the determination, but also to follow up the patient and see if the patient is going in the right direction uh, and responding as you would expect. Uh, um, you know, and then, you know, those patients that have minimal to or no inflammation and, um, you know, then, then should be potentially considered for pericardectomy as those patients that despite multiple cycles of in, in, in anti-inflammatory therapy, they continue to have a refractory constriction, and, and that's kind of more of a, you know, a difficult case. I think that just to, you know, you know uh, conclude, and, and, and this is kind of are some of the take-home points, uh, you know, peripheral diseases are very, you know, compress a very broad range of condition that often might coexist, which is making it a little more difficult. Uh, I think it's important that when you look at effusion, you look just beyond size and, 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 and uh, you know, tamponade. Uh, I think it's important to, to look into, you know, potential causes uh, and, and potential complications. You know, cardiac MRI it plays a role which is central in the management and diagnosis of acute recurrent pericarditis. Um, I, I think it's, um, it's important that the integration of imaging multimodality uh, is, 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 is key to facilitate the diagnosis and management and characterization of patients with uh, contractive pericarditis. And, and uh, you know, um, novel application of uh, imaging multimodality such as PET, uh, as well as, like, you know, a new imaging biomarkers with measurement of LGE and so forth, you know, might be, you know, uh, coming in the in the in the near future, might be very useful uh, to guide uh, the management of these patients. Uh, so, so with that, I'll just stop here and uh, stop uh, my uh, screen share here. And, you know, um, you know, I think I'll, I'll just kind of open up now for my my uh, former fellow and 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 a friend. Uh, Margaret Fritt, who is going to now take on on the first case, uh, where we're going to now get into the clinical aspect of things and how we use imaging and how we guide the management of these, these complex patients. Thank you so much, uh, Aldo. It's uh, truly a pleasure to be here tonight, and uh, I have the pleasure of presenting the first case, so why don't we get right into it.
Um, I'll start off by presenting a, a 73 year old lady whose uh, past medical history is significant for cryptogenic organizing pneumonia or COP and also uh, pulmonary fibrosis. She's had a history of sweet syndrome and irritable bowel syndrome. Her family history is not particularly relevant and her medications are listed. She actually presents to the CHESS Institute where she's followed by her pulmonologist for her COP. She presents with chest pressures and dyspnea and the original impression really is a COP exacerbation. So at that point in time, she started on a low dose prednisone with a relatively rapid taper. However, once the taper was started, the pains had recurred and she felt it was necessary to present to the emergency room. Upon arrival, her high sensitivity CRP was uh, 54, and she describes her pain as sharp, left-sided near the axilla, increased with inspiration and when lying flat, then relieved when bending forward. So at this point, a CT chest is ordered because of this uh, uh, thought that maybe COP is uh, leading to all the symptomology. And while the CT findings were not particularly uh, exciting for COP, what was noted was that there was a moderate size pericardial effusion with some faint enhancement of the pericardial layers, as uh, Aldo had uh, suggested earlier, um, which could be suggestive of some degree of, of uh, pericarditis. And uh, on further characterization with the Houndsville unit of roughly three, this was felt to be a transudate. Not surprisingly, this would follow up with an echo, and we could see here in these sort of basic views um, that we do uh, appreciate a pericardial effusion, not quite as uh, echo lucent as we would have expected, and so uh, you know certainly uh, suggest that maybe there's some inflammatory component to this. Um, while the right atrial pressures uh, were not particularly normal, they weren't uh, dramatic, and uh, we really had no overt signs of uh, hemodynamic compromise. So at this point, with an HSCRP that has now continued to rise, she gets a diagnosis of acute pericarditis. Um, uh, she started on 25 milligrams, or rather she's increased her prednisone to 25 milligrams per day. Colchicine has started. She's uh, suggested the exercise restriction, and she gets uh, sent to the pericardial clinic. Two months later, we have normalization of our CRP. Her symptoms have resolved, and we initiate the tapering process um, with a, a follow-up. And once she really gets through all her medications, um, nothing has really recurred, and so we, we feel that we've had resolution of her pericarditis. A couple of months later, uh, she shows up at the emergency room again with a recurrence of pain, which was positional. However, this time was mostly abdominal, so there was a distinct difference. Uh, CT abdomen was ordered for further evaluation and an echocardiogram, and at this point, her high sensitivity CRP was 65. So, of course, she would get a repeat echocardiogram given her history, and we can see here that there's some brisk motion of the ventricles, that the effusion has certainly improved, if not all resolved. Um, her radial pressures have normalized, and uh, there's really no suggestion of any sort of ventricular dysfunction or any suggestion that uh, there might be some malignant effusion. She would also get a CT abdomen, and we can always sort of get a sneak peek of the uh, of the heart and the upper uh, up the upper slices. And uh, we do get a tiny glimpse here, and we can see here that the effusion is much improved. And we certainly can um, sort of can exclude, but can't really see very well if the pericardial layers are affected or enhancing. So with this diagnostic incertitude, we have this, ab this abnormal pain that we weren't really familiar with, which is an elevated CRP and no real uh, significant effusion on echo. We decided to go for an MRI as a, uh, to better assess the pericardium. And so we can see here in the top left on our BSSFP CINE imaging that we have similar imaging that we had uh, identified on echo, no normal biventricular function, uh, no significant effusion. Uh, we can see in the bottom left uh, what seems to be no significant interventricular dependence on our free breathing uh, sequences. And then on the right side, we can see our late enhancement imaging, and we can see a nice sort of thin enhancement circumferential, uh, rather mild, if you will, of that enhancement of a pericarditis, sorry, uh, of the pericardium suggesting pericarditis. And so we would go on to quantify this, and it wasn't um, of the highest uh, quartile, if you will, uh, but it was at um, 49 cubic centimeters. So now uh, that we have all this information, she gets diagnosed with a recurrence. Uh, she's put back on prednisone, 25 milligrams per day, colchicine and exercise restriction. Uh, we again see her six weeks later, her CRP and her symptoms are normalized. We begin the tapering process, but shortly when she gets to 15 milligrams, uh, the pain does recur and her CRP does rise a bit. And so we decide to go back up on her prednisone to a dose that she felt much more comfortable at, and we started a much slower taper. But even though three months later, when she would eventually make it to 12 and a half milligrams, uh, her CRP would rise as well as her pains would recur. And at this point, we had uh, decided to uh, get her on an Akinra. And so while uh, we uh, jumped through all the necessary hoops, um, six weeks later on her injections, uh, we would see her in the complete absence of symptoms and a big smile on her face. Uh, her CRP had normalized and the prednisone had been tapering in the background. And at our most recent visit, uh, we still have stability of the situation, so we're very happy with that. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention.
Thanks, Michael. That was a great presentation. Also, all done, that was a great presentation. So if I can uh, start off the discussion. So, uh, uh, Michael, interesting case. Um, how long are you going to treat with Anna Kinra? Um, and then we can open up for the rest of the panel. So, uh, excellent question. I did find her overall tableau rather immunological. So we were hoping for about three months and then uh, progressive taper of one injection every week to see if we can get her off. Okay, let's open up to the panel. Um, maybe Antonio, you want you to start? Yeah, I, if I may, I would like to start for, you know, thank you for putting this together. And uh, Dr. Shinone Aldo, you did a wonderful overview that really, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, Michael, Dr. Shatrit, it was really interesting case. I, I, you know, those are kind of cases that uh, unfortunately we see too often in our, uh, in our clinic and uh, the imaging were great. Um, so, you know, along the line, you know, I'm, I'm not an imaging specialist, uh, uh, but I do appreciate the value of imaging. Um, and, um, you know, you know, we often talk about complicated pericarditis, you know, the fact the patient had an effusion already. Um, why did you choose uh, to use uh, prednisone up front, you know, the, as a first line? Um, I suspect that had something to do with the patient characteristics, but I think this is worth talking about it in the choice of, of steroids in this patient. Thank you very much for that question. I think it's a very relevant one. Um, at the onset of the disease, um, there was this sort of competing diagnosis of uh, cryptogenic organizing pneumonia for which prednisone had originally been prescribed. In discussion with the respirologist, there were some pulmonary fibrosis changes, of course, that could be chronic or acute, so it wasn't entirely sure if there could have been a component. And um, she was still being worked up for a possible rheumatological um, disease that might have incorporated all these findings. And so with that, we felt that prednisone in her case, albeit uh, low dose, 0.2 to 0.5 mates per kg, uh, would be uh, the more appropriate course, although I do, uh, I am obviously a firm believer um, in NSAIDs uh, as well. Yeah, maybe I can, uh, Alan, I can pass the ball to uh, uh, Brittany Weber because I think, you know, this use of prednisone early in the patients in which, you know, an autoimmune disease is suspected or diagnosed is common. And, you know, uh, with her experience uh, in, the, in the Brigham, uh, Brittany probably sees this a lot. Um, what, would you want to add something, Brittany? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antonio. And thank you all, Dr. Shannon and Dr. Street. This is just and such a fantastic discussion and excellent cases and one um, we all deal with dealing with pericardial diseases. And I agree. I actually had one of my questions was that first, you know, what was the rationale for um, prednisone, but then realized it was the COP competing diagnosis. And in my cardiorheumatology clinic, I see this all the time, where patients with um, suspected or a known autoimmune disorder present just, you know, sometimes it's not just pericarditis, and this makes it very challenging that they also present with, like, serocytis features, they have pleuritis, or they have other features of axis lupus, and a rheumatologist is going to prescribe prednisone. Oftentimes, they actually prescribe very high dose, right? So, Michael, you, you sort of low dose here. And so it's very challenging of how do you figure out what is the right optimal treatment when the diagnosis is unclear in the beginning. And I expected that was the reason this was, um, this was added. I did have a question for you, um, Michael, is that by the time of the second visit, you know, the patient already had a lot of high-risk features. Do you think there could have been a rationale um, for starting, you know, IL-1 inhibition at that point, um, was in, in just curious, was that discussed, um, or kind of where did you guys decide to think about that in the time course? Certainly, and my question will certainly be a reflection of the Canadian healthcare system, and simply that um, in order to get Anakinra, there's roughly a four month delay, um, and sometimes we can get a bridging program, but ultimately, uh, the idea here was that we had access to prednisone, there was a response. However, admittedly, once the first uh, taper had failed. Uh, the workup for Anakinra had already been initiated in the discussions as well, uh, but uh, the time delay is uh, not in, in part because the patient wanted to see if we can just stay with the prednisone, uh, but also because uh, there was a couple of administrative hurdles uh, to make sure that the medication would be covered by the ca Canadian healthcare. Yeah, Paul, um, can you uh, talk briefly about Rolanicep versus Anakinra? I know in Canada, Rolanicept is not approved, um, and a Kenra is. Uh, um, so what would be, uh, if you had the access to either one, uh, what would be some of the uh, strengths and weaknesses of those uh, two biologics? Sure, and, and uh, thank you, Alan, and great talk, Aldo, and Mike, fantastic case. Um, yeah, I think before getting to that, what I would highlight, which has been touched upon, is 
uh, the presentation of cough, I would remind everyone, you know, that that can be uh, a prominent symptom in patients with pericarditis. So certainly in my clinic, I see patients who maybe have some pericarditis chest pain, but do have a prominent uh, cough uh, that's, that's really most troublesome for them. And they've been seeing pulmonologists before they, before they come to see you. Um, and the other thing is, you know, I think what we're touching upon is how do you integrate the imaging into your therapeutic selection and duration? Um, and I would say that most of our imaging um, in terms of guiding therapy is in multiple recurrent pericarditis patients. So the observational studies that we have done, that others have done, um, these are patients with multiple recurrences. Um, and clearly the late gadolinium enhancement on the MRI is one of the features that helps to inform what drug you should use and for how long. Um, and you mentioned Rolanicept in, in the Rhapsody trial. Uh, in patients who were assigned to placebo, we did see that those um, who had uh, prominent pericardial late gadolinium enhancement, so moderate or severe, recurred earlier. Um, so it clearly is an important biomarker of the severity of the disease. Um, so this case is a first recurrence. So I, I think this is where um, we don't have clinical trial data to guide that decision. Um, but I think a lot of us would say in the really quote-unquote bad cases of a first recurrence, um, we may be searching for an interleukin-1 blocker. Um, if the CRP has been very high, um, if there's a lot of pericardial late gadolinium enhancement, um, if there's some of these high-risk features uh, that were talked about. Um, so in this case, it's, again, it's a little hard to say. I suspect you're going to need a longer course than, than three months before starting your taper of anakinra. Um, but uh, we don't have a lot of head-to-head -head data uh, with, or any really head-to-head -head data with Anakira and Rolanicept. Um, so, so I think it, it's whatever your practice pattern is um, in the healthcare setting uh, that you're in. Uh, but I would say generally that the interleukin-1 blockers are, are highly effective uh, at treating the active recurrence, uh, the active flare, and, and also in preventing recurrence. The final thing that I would just note that I think this case highlights, which, which Aldo also touched upon, is the sort of opportunistic value of CT. Um, I think, you know, we think of CT as not really a primary diagnostic modality uh, in patients with pericarditis, but a lot of patients going through the emergency room get a CT. And so I think for us as cardiologists, really learning to pay attention to those findings, because a lot of ER radiologists may not be uh, used to seeing, you know, what does a free wall rupture look like on a CT or, or a VSR? I, I know Mike Tong and I have had some cases like that in the, in the ER where you, you make that diagnosis with CT. Um, and this one as well, where you see the pericardial, where you see the pericardial fusion and you get a sense of, of what's going on. Thanks, uh, Paul, uh, for important insights. Um, Michael, uh, as a surgeon, uh, uh, when you hear all this discussion of multimodal imaging and um, and some of the biologics um, from the surgical point of view. Um, any comments on uh, Michael's case? Yeah, th thank you, Alan. Fantastic case and great discussion. So, Michael, um, for a patient like this, this is the second occurrence that you've had. Um, now, at what point would you refer this patient to surgery? Um, uh, if uh, if you know the the medications that uh, the interleukin one receptor blockade, they're they're quite expensive as you mentioned, and it's uh, quite a hurdle to get them in the certain healthcare system. So at what point do you feel that these patients should be referred for surgery for more definitive treatment? Uh, so excellent question. Um, certainly, I would have to be a failure of the interleukin ones. Um, and uh, up till, till now, I haven't had uh, that experience in my own personal practice. Um, but really, because uh, the experience here in Canada is not quite as extensive as that in the U.S., uh, there's always a reluctance to try and remove a pericardium that is actively inflamed and uh, with uh, not in the proper hands. And so uh, my particular experience, I haven't uh, reached it yet, but it would certainly be somebody who is uh, very, very symptomatic uh, and sort of breaking through uh, breaking through the drugs. Um, the uh, But I certainly uh, feel that maybe this discussion can also be opened up to the rest of the panel, as uh, some of the other of our other colleagues here might have had uh, cases that uh, uh, ended up uh, with a pericardiectomy for this type of situation. Although yeah, one thing, and, and you, Michael, yeah. yeah, one thing I do want to mention is, um, you know, usually when you have these patients come in with an acute exacerbation and they have acute inflammation, 
Um, that's typically not when we want to do operation. It makes the surgery a lot more complicated. It makes it a lot bloodier operation. And our ability to get a complete um, radical pericardectomy is much more diminished when you have acute inflammatory disease. So, you know, typically we prefer to operate on these patients when they're at the, you know, when the inflammation is is gone and when they have normal ESR and CRP. So, um, you know, certainly if a patient has recurrent uh, symptoms and uh, recurrent episodes, um, you know, the, the time to discuss surgery is, uh, is before they come back within a new inflammatory state. So these are some of the considerations for surgery because it certainly makes our lives a lot easier and we can get a patient back to you with a much better surgical result. And that's a rule of thumb. Uh, you know, we've had some experiences when um, that didn't happen, but we learn now not to operate when that, when they're still inflamed, sort of calm it down and, and get, get ready for surgery. Um, Aldo, uh, any last comments before we move on to the next things? Yeah, I just want to kind of make a final kind of question to the panel. And I think that, I mean, in, in this case, uh, I mean, we already kind of saw how important it is just to kind of really secure the diagnosis and, and, and perhaps, as, as Paul just mentioned, guide length of therapy. But um, how often, if, if, if ever, you, you repeat the MRI, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, to see if there's any, you know, resolution before you start tapering, you know, do you use clinical plus biomarkers plus imaging in complex patient, you know, you know, uh, is that something that uh, you, you would recommend? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Aldo, and one I'm really curious to hear what everyone's practice is. Um, I do repeat the MRIs. It was actually Dr. Klein who taught me not to repeat it too soon because it can take time to show clinical change. So typically I will make, wait for the like six month to one year period. Um, I was also kind of having similar feelings that I would probably patient on and her a little bit longer. Um, but again, we don't we don't also have the data as well. Um, and um, I do I use imaging as well as biomarkers and symptoms. So those are my three things and I use those all in conjunction. But in my experience I haven't been tapering before except in a few clinical cases before kind of that one year mark. Um, and then various successes um, with, with with tapering. And then the question of how to taper is still an, an ongoing question. Well, yeah, I, yeah. Um, no, it's a it's a good question, Aldo, and I think an area where we need further uh, research because there's not clear answers. Uh, I, I think in part to to Michael Tong's question, uh, you know, the interleukin blockers are very effective uh, controlling the pericarditis. So then it becomes a discussion with the patient if you have a really severe case and a long duration of treatment, where you start having a um, shared decision making on, 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 you know, whether they want surgery or to continue on therapy. And so in that setting, the MRI can be helpful to say, okay, the inflammation has resolved, this may be a good time to do surgery if that's the wish uh, uh, of the patient. Uh, but I think also, just as you highlighted in your talk, it's, it's when, um, you know, I repeat it when the patient is, is behaving in a way that I'm not expecting, um, or the diagnosis is unclear. Um, so, I, so I don't do as much of sort of routine follow-up, um, or, or if I do, I, I do space it out um, quite some time, you know, t the order of 12 to 18 months, um, and then I'm sort of using it to, as Brittany uh, touched upon as, as one parameter to try and make a decision about how long to continue therapy or what the next step in treatment uh, should be. Actually, just as an anecdote, uh, the patients uh, are, are desperate to get better. And uh, they often, uh, when you see, when you repeat it, whether six months or a year, they often take a picture of their MRI before and after just to show that they're improving and they're still on, still on the medicines. But with that, is just a uh, anecdote. Well, we'll move on to, um, to Sneha. Vakamudi is going to present an interesting case. Sneha. Right. All right. Hopefully you guys can all see my screen. Yes. Uh, yes so presenting a second case. Thank you so much, Dr. Klein and all your colleagues who are on for this opportunity. Um, so we'll dive right into it. So when pericardiocentesis is not enough. So we have a 64-year-old male who presented to our emergency department after developing progressive shortness of breath and lightheadedness. When we talked to him about his history, he did note that he'd had a viral upper respiratory illness a few weeks prior, maybe three or four weeks before. 
In the ER, his vitals were remarkable for tachycardia with heart rates up to the 130s and a systolic blood pressure that was low, especially for the patient's baseline running in the 80s to 90s. We obtained an echocardiogram um, as part of his workup, and correlating with the clinical signs of tachycardia and hypotension, again, we're presenting just a brief view of his echo, but there's a circumferential moderate to large effusion, and along with this and some other images had signs um, that correlated to clinical tamponade. So the patient underwent a pericardiocentesis. Immediately upon drainage of the effusion, his heart rate improved into the 70s and blood pressure increased to the 130s systolic. We removed about 600 mLs of serosanguinous fluid. Um, he did have intrapericardial pressures checked during the procedure with a 20 millimeter of mercury intrapericardial pressure pre and 14 millimeters post. On admission, his labs were remarkable for biomarkers, including an elevated a sed rate of 47 and CRP of 22.7. He had been started on colchicine um, kind of prior and after the pericardiocentesis and a follow-up limited uh, post-pericardiocentesis echo was ordered. So on the post-pericardiocentesis echo, we do see that the effusion has essentially been completely drained. Um, but what we did notice was there was some evidence of septal bounce and, and even though there's no respirometer on here, possibly some uh, respirophasic septal shift. In addition to that echo, about two to three days later, the patient developed new symptoms of lower extremity edema and recurrent shortness of breath, kind of out of proportion to the fact that the effusion was all gone. Due to concerns for this abnormal septal motion that we saw in his post-procedural echo, we ordered a CMR. So here you can see the free breathing sequence on his CMR, and you can see as the patient takes a breath in, there's clear septal shift of the interventricular septum from the RV towards the LV. And then on delayed gadolinium imaging, you can see diffuse, kind of severe circumferential pericardial enhancement. And importantly, we can see enhancement of not only the parietal, but the, the second layer, the visceral pericardium. Based on this, we made a diagnosis of effusive constrictive pericarditis. The patient was continued on his colchicine, but we added high-dose um, aspirin as well as diuretics to treat his symptomatic heart failure. Um, after about three months on this therapy, a repeat outpatient echo was ordered. And on the left, you can see the in-hospital post-procedural echo where we saw that septal shift. And on the right, you can see his echo after about three months of therapy where again that, that septal bounce is almost gone and we don't really see any evidence of septal shift. The patient's been followed up for about a year after his diagnosis and has now been weaned off all anti-inflammatory therapies. He's only using diuretics as needed um, and NYHA class one, so essentially without symptoms, and follow-up uh, inflammatory markers show that his sed rates and CRP have decreased to seven and 0.5 respectively. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Okay, thanks, uh, Stan. That was a, a brilliant case, a uh, fusic constriction. Um, Paul, you, did, you wrote a, uh, a editorial about fusic constriction. Any, any comments about uh, uh, this case, uh, how long to treat as well? Uh, any comments, Paul? Yeah, thank you, Sneha. Uh, great case. Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, I think they're, they're probably um, – over the years has been a, has been a shift from more uh, extensive invasive hemodynamic monitoring of these patients and more of a reliance on echocardiography. Um, certainly in our CCU, I think we probably use more right heart catheters than, than, than pretty much anyone in the country in terms of CCUs. Um, so if there's any question, you know, tamponade is still a hemodynamic diagnosis and you can always put in a right heart catheter. There may be certain emergency situations like this where you don't need to or clinically you don't need to. Um, but I think it's important just to, to recognize, as Sneha showed, that when we think about effusive constrictive pericarditis, it is when the intrapericardial pressure does not normalize uh, after pericardial synthesis or when the right atrial pressure doesn't normalize if you have a right heart catheter in or, or decrease by at least 50%. Um, so, so nowadays, you know, though, I, I think most of these patients where we're doing the pericardiosynthesis is actually not with uh, a lot of invasive hemodynamic monitoring, and we're, we're re relying on the, a lot on the echo, one, for guidance, and two, for this assessment for effusive constriction. Uh, and I think we get back to what Sneha showed, uh, 
Um, and what Aldo touched upon uh, during his lecture is that, you know, the classic feature, um, the pathognomonic feature, if you will, of constricted pathophysiology is the uh, disassociation of intrathoracic and uh, uh, intrapericardial pressure so that you get enhanced ventricular inter, uh, interdependence. So you see that respirophasic uh, septal shift um, with, with inspiration. Um, so very important to look for that. That's sort of a defining feature. Um, and, and often we see that quite well on echo. Um, and, and on MRI, as you showed, we can see that as well with the free breathing sequence. Uh, I think just as a, as a small point, um, which your case showed nicely, is really that respirophasic septal shift should happen during early uh, inspiration. Um, sometimes if patients take a, a really deep breath, you can see it uh, late, and that may be maybe more of a nonspecific finding. But again, we're, we're typically com combining seeing that respirophasic septal shift with one of those other features that Aldo mentioned, um, a feature of, of accentuated early diastolic filling, so uh, a, a higher septal E-prime velocity or annulus reversus where the septal E-prime is higher than the lateral E-prime. Uh, and if you can get it, then the, the hepatic, vein, hepatic vein Doppler profile is very helpful for looking for that expiratory diastolic flow reversal. So with inspiration, everything sort of shifts to the left with decreased left ventricular filling, and with expiration, everything sort of shifts back, and that's what you can see with your hepatic vein uh, profile. Um, so yeah, I think it can get complicated pretty quickly, but I, but I think as you always just sort of tether yourself, if you will, to the fact that, that it's characterized by accentuated interventricular dependence, and look for those features um, at, in any patient with concern of constriction, uh, but certainly in the patient after pericardiocentesis where you're thinking about effusive constrictive pathophysiology. And again, of course, these patients need anti-inflammatory therapy. Uh, I think what you decide to go with really depends on the overall clinical pr uh, presentation. Michael, uh, Michael Tonga, were you going to comment? Um, yeah, effusive okay. constriction. Uh, they say there's a visceral epi epicarditis, and uh, Stan did <laughs> show the visceral lining um, a little bit enhanced. Uh, any comments? Yeah, um, yeah, these cases, um, you know, when we do take them to the operating room, you know, it's, it's, it's really fascinating how, uh, you know, you take out the parietal pericardium and then it still looks like you haven't done any work because you still have that shiny, um, uh, shiny rind on the heart. And then, and then it's when you start peeling that layer off, then the heart just pops out and it's, it's very satisfying to see. And, you know, sometimes you go in and you're not quite sure the diagnosis, but when you see the heart pop out, then you, you really know that you've made the right diagnosis. Um, now, um, nowadays, you know, our cardiology team is so good at doing these pericardiosynthesis with echo guidance that we rarely see um, get any consults to do um, surgical pericardial windows. Um, and And for the patient, it's probably better because there, there's nothing that I get, there's no situation where I get more worried than taking a patient to the OR for a pericardial window and then seeing these patients getting induced because often that's when you see these patients crump, um, you know, shortly after induction. So, you know, the fact that you guys are, um, have gotten so skilled at using echo guidance is, um, is, is, has really changed uh, the treatment for these patients and for these effusive pericardial constriction disease. Antonio or Aldo? Antonio, any, any comments? Yeah, no, this is a great case, and you know, it's always a, a good case to comment on, you know, how uh, important the inflammation here, here is in this case. You know, you take away the fluid, but you haven't solved the issue because the inflammation is overwhelming in this case. And um, and so, um, you know, the what what I would say is uh, I would. I would ask, or I would comment that I, you know, I, I would I would have probably been the more aggressive with the anti-inflammatory uh, therapy. I would ask uh, uh, Dr. Ramakudi, uh, uh, were there any consideration for you know biologic early? I think you know, but you know now we you know we're getting more and more comfortable with this. And but you know, as Dr. Kramer pointed out early uh, earlier, that the biologics were tested in randomized control trials for patients who had recurrent pericarditis, multiple recurrent pericarditis. So this would be an off-label use, but certainly 
Uh, I'm glad that this patient did well with colchicine, but it's cert- I would be concerned that uh, colchicine would not be enough. Uh, I would be considering steroids. I would be considered biologic because, um, again, you want to avoid uh, that constrictions becomes permanent. I would avoid sending this patient to the surger- surgeon um, and uh, becoming, you know, from an inflammatory constriction to more fibrotic constriction. Um, and so um, that would be, um, these are very challenging cases. Um, in, you know, you don't see often um, the few that come to my mind ended up having a rheumatologic disease underlying, especially rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, so that's something that I would want to ask was this patient offered a rheumatologic workup. Um, and finally, uh, you know, another follow-up question, this very interesting case is, did you do a follow-up MRI? You know, we talked earlier about, you know, when do you do a follow-up MRI? Well, a case like this, you certainly would want to make sure the patient is very well healed before you stop that treatment because, again, constriction is one of those complications of pericarditis that can become life-threatening. Uh, is, you know, it, although it's not tamponade, it kills you within hours and days, constriction can kill you over uh, months and years, and it may lead you to a surgery that is certainly a major surgery. So, um, Zneha, what can you tell you about, uh, tell me about uh, the choices of the, uh, of the anti-inflammatory therapies, the workup for rheumatologic disease, and the uh, choice of uh, uh, later imaging? I think this will be informative. Yeah, I think those are all really great questions and great points. Um, We were somewhat limited in this patient because of his geographic location. He lived about three hours outside of Austin, so his ability to come back and forth for monitoring on biologics to get repeat imaging was pretty limited. Um, But I think outside of that, 100%, I think we're getting better at being aggressive on the early side in a lot of cardiac diseases. We see it in shock, and I think there's no reason to not have the same thing for pericardial disease. I think having the option of a biologic early um, would be great, especially to, like you said, one, prevent recurrence, and then prevent overall progression to kind of chronic constrictive pericarditis that we would eventually have to probably send to Dr. Tong um, for very difficult surgery. And then I think, like you said, repeat imaging is paramount. Um, idea, in the ideal situation, you know, either during the taper or after the taper, um, definitely at a year, we would like to re-image that patient, not only to get a more thorough assessment of that constrictive physiology, but to truly see that that enhancement, not only uh, he, he had acute edema and T2-weighted imaging during the hospitalization, um, but also to see that that late gadolinium enhancement has decreased. I think having the pericardiocentesis before your MRI is always a little bit of a complicating factor in my mind. You know, how much does that needle actually cause some inflammation? And so having um, kind of more uh, drawn out serial imaging, I think, is extremely important. Although Thank you. Comments? Although, yeah, so I know I know it's a little bit of redundancy, but I think I think this is a very important case and something that you know it might be easily missed in practice. Um, so you know I see often in practice that after the the pericardial disease, we're looking for recurrence of of the effusion, and that's all what people are looking for, uh, and they don't look about anything else. Uh, and I think it's important to really. It's just not a limited study for effusion recurrence. It has to be a kind of a full pericardial study to look for, uh, you know, effusion, of course, but also, you know, effusive constrictive physiology. And we, we need to be very pushy in a way to really get those pressures in, in the pericardium, as in this case was kind of very well kind of uh, uh, highlighted. Um, you know, um, the only question that I have, is this is a little bit of controversial, and just to see what the, but, but the, the panel thing is that, you know, Anyone has any experience in, in, in um, one, the use of PET uh, as a kind of a emerging imaging tool for, for identifying inflammation, um, you know? Um, I mean, because I wonder if, like, you know, what the sensitivity of MRI might be. I mean, there might be some cases that when you have, like, this effusive constriction, which is maybe not as a reprogram, but might be more subtle, um, you know, is there any role for something like PET to be more sensitive for inflammation? Uh, is that feasible? You guys see see that uh, coming into practice, or you think is uh, it's going to be very difficult to image uh, with FTG? Yeah, Aldo, um, I think that's such a great question. And as uh, Dr. Kramer knows, I've even um, asked him about this because, um, as Aldo knows, um, I, I train under Dr. DeCarly, and I use PET a lot for um, perfusion PET for microvascular dysfunction. But I think about the role of PET a lot. 
and I thought about how we need better imaging surrogates. MRI is great, but whether it's specific enough for actually showing us the actual biology of IL-1 inflammation. The challenge with FTG, at least in my clinical experience, is I've ordered it for patients who can't have MRIs because they have a contraindication MRI. And in those cases, especially some of these really challenging recurrent patients, they haven't lit up. I have seen it lit up in a handful of cases when they present acutely inflamed with that initial episode. So my concern is whether it's going to be sensitive enough for these challenging cases of um, patients who have long-standing recurrence and monitoring the, you know, how we predict the, the length of therapy. Yeah, I, I agree with, with Brittany. Um, you know, I would say that MRI is clearly established in the evaluation of, of pericardial disease, whereas F18DG, FDG is clearly more, needs more research to support its use. And I think something like sort of Brittany was alluding to is to have a group of patients and a research protocol and do an MRI and do a PET and, and look at the correlation. Uh, because my anecdotal experience, and, you know, we've written up case reports uh, of this, and, and you showed the, the case series data that was published in JAK a, a few years ago. I think that was from Mayo, correct me, I may be wrong on that. But, um, um, but you know, I, I think that the acute ones will light up. You know, I have a, a patient who is getting oncology screening for their cancer, and they happen to have acute pericarditis, and you see it. Um, but I'm not sure about the recurrent cases. Um, but I would also say that just in general, my experience has been these effusive constrictive cases, they're like really inflamed. So I, 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 I think, yes, I mean, that, you know, so again, it may be, uh, I don't think we know the value of, of, of FDG. Anecdotally, it seems to be more helpful or just found incidentally in an acute case, uh, but, but clearly an area that needs further research. And I don't think, you know, I don't want to give the impression that that's really part of clinical practice, whereas I think MRI clearly is part of our of our daily clinical practice in, in treating these patients. Absolutely. And uh, just one other comment. Um, the Mayo uh, guys have, um, have published on uh, can you di diagnose effusive constriction uh, just with the fluids? So in other words, there are some Doppler signs that you almost can predict uh, effusive constriction after the tap or after the window. So there are some uh, echo features. And I agree with Antonio that um, once you start seeing constriction or constrictive physiology, uh, I probably would um, opt for you know more aggressive uh, approach. Um, uh, the aspirin was good, but uh, probably you know steroids you want to avoid, but they may need steroids and um, or, or something else. And we're trying to avoid the steroids uh, these days. Uh, on that note, uh, maybe Aldo, why don't you introduce the next um, um, discussant? Absolutely. So it's a, it's a pleasure to have Tom Wan here with us, and um, you know he's gonna uh, just kind of uh, present a case of uh, a couple of cases actually uh, of uh, constriction. So uh, thanks, uh, you know, Tom for, for for being in the in the webinar, and then uh, really excited to to listen to your cases. Thanks very much, Aldo. Um, everyone can see my slide and hear me. Yes. Thank you. So uh, thanks for the opportunity to present in this uh, interesting ACC webinar. Uh, it's been a very uh, exciting and uh, interesting discussion, and uh, I'm glad to see many of my current and former colleagues here on the, uh, on the, in the panel. So I'm going to present uh, two cases to sort of provide contrasting uh, presentations of what we can see with uh, pericardial constriction. Um, so the first case is a patient who's a 79-year-old female with history of atrial fibrillation and prior ablation, as well as hypertension, dyslipidemia, who presented to cardiology clinic with shortness of breath, fatigue, ankle swelling, and some chest pains, probably progressing over the last one and a half years. So this is sort of a non-specific presentation. Um, it was in the hospital recently uh, with what was considered heart failure and was uh, started on furosemide diuretic with good effect of losing weight, uh, fluid weight, as well as was cardioverted from his AFib. His medications are listed on the screen. His examination was notable for um, so J JVD, Kuzmos sign, pericardial knock, and mild edema. Uh, the lab tests actually showed that there was uh, re some renal impairment, mildly elevated inflammatory markers in terms of the SED rate and the high sensitivity um, CRP, and also elevated NT pro BNP. So we look at the imaging of this patient. Uh, if we think about the um, you know, the cases that we're presenting, the patient had um, the dilated IVC with minimal collapse. There was a septal shift uh, with uh, 
on the echocardiogram, the apical four-chamber view, and somewhat conical deformity of the uh, ventricle. If we look at the uh, tissue uh, Doppler uh, of the septal E prime was 14, lateral E prime of 8, so there's uh, elevated septal uh, E prime as well as annulus reverses. Uh, the patient had a CT when he first uh, was uh, seen uh, uh, in hospital recently, and that showed quite extensive pericardial calcifications. And we did a cardiac MRI here, and it showed that there was some pericardial thickening on the uh, free breathing sequence. We can see that there was some uh, respirophasic septal shift. Um, and on the delayed enhancement images, there was none to maybe minimal uh, pericardial enhancement. Uh, the patient also had a, a cath, right heart cath, as indicated on the screen, uh, where there's elevated RA and wedge pressures that were of similar value. Um, and sort of moderate, moderately elevated pulmonary pressures and no significant coronary disease. So as a result of this, the impression uh, in our pericardial clinic was of chronic calcific constrictive pericarditis. Um, the underlying etiology is uncertain and may be related to the previous AF ablation or idiopathic. Um, the patient didn't really recall, uh, had some chest pain ongoing in the last few years, but no sort of emissions or treatments for pericarditis inflammation. Uh, and we referred the patient uh, for surgery. Uh, and so radical pericardiectomy was performed via stenotomy. And this was largely an uncomplicated uh, seven-day hospital stay other than uh, brief episodes of post-op AF. The surgical pathology came back as pericardial thickening with calcifications, but no uh, evidence of inflammation, uh, necrosis, exudative tumor. Um, and at follow-up, which was about two months later, the patient felt a lot better with resolution of shortness of breath, was undergoing cardiac rehab to recover from the surgery, and was back to driving uh, and sort of usual daily activities. If we look at the second case, which is a 71-year-old man uh, who had a more acute presentation to hospital with inferior STEMI, uh, needing defibrillation with complicated by torsades, the acute cath has shown there was uh, distal RC and PA occlusion, so uh, stenting was uh, performed drug eluting stents to this area. Uh, in the CICU, about uh, one to two nights later, uh, then suddenly developed uh, hypertension and bradycardia. Uh, so it was a cold call and the echo showed that the patient had uh, pericardial tamponade. And emergency pericardial synthesis was performed and finding basically some uh, blood in the pericardial space. Uh, so it was considered that there could be an acute complication from the PCI, so the patient was transferred to uh, OR and had emergency surgical repair of the uh, ruptured um, acute marginal branch of the RCA. Uh, this was, you know, a long, uh, complicated admission. The patient needed dialysis, slow intubation, and unfortunately had recurrence of uh, pericardial tamponade uh, about a week later and then had a surgical window at this point. And then following that, uh, unfortunately, started to develop worsening chest pain and shortness of breath as well. Um, so we look at the imaging uh, at this point in time. So the top left imaging is the initial uh, presentation when he had a large pericardial fusion and tamponade, uh, whereas this is the subsequent uh, echo following the window. Um, and you can see that there is some uh, septal, uh, abnormal septal motion. Um, again, there's the dilated IVC and uh, without collapse. And a CT scan done around that time, there was the synonymy wires from the surgery, but there was no pericardial calcifications and a small left pleural fusion. So the patient also underwent a cardiac MRI uh, at this point, really to establish, com, you know, confirm the diagnosis of constriction, but also to look for any inflammation given the chest pains. And you can here see that there is some pericardial thickening uh, on the free breathing sequence again with uh, inspiration, there was a marked uh, inspiratory septal shift to the left. And on T2 stir imaging, we can see that there was uh, increased signal, a moderately increased signal of the pericardium indicating pericardial edema. And on delayed enhancement imaging, uh, finding moderate circumferential pericardial enhancement consistent with inflammation. So the overall impression of this patient was initially a STEMI PCI complication with pericardial fusion and tamponade requiring pericardial synthesis and window, and then subsequently developing both uh, pericardial constriction, uh, perhaps considered as effusive constrictive after the fusion was removed, but also inflammation uh, pericarditis as well. So the patient uh, was already on uh, DAPT initially because of the uh, the uh, uh, percutaneous current intervention, uh, so we just, uh, it was decided to increase the aspirin dose to a uh, high dose to for its anti-inflammatory properties as well as adding in colchicine and then continuing with the other cardiac medications. The patient was followed up 
at the follow-up clinic in three months, uh, was feeling a lot better. Uh, Colchicine was actually stopped uh, one week before that because of its side effect, but uh, aspirin was uh, gradually weaned down. Uh, we look at the echo and MRI findings on the next slide at this point, and then further follow-up um, about eight months after the initial presentation, patient was just on one stay of aspirin, uh, no longer on colchicine, and was uh, continued to feel well. So the follow-up uh, imaging, this was done at about two months' time. You can see that from uh, the echo side of things, the IVC size is now normal with uh, normal col uh, more than 50% collapse. Uh, the septal motion was less pronounced. There's still a little bit of a septal bounce. Um, but the tissue Doppler, you can see that the um, septal E prime was uh, now 5 and the lateral E prime was 8, so there was no longer the uh, uh, annulus reverses. The inflammatory markers have all uh, gradually improved to normalizing over time. Uh, and on the follow-up MRI, which was done um, at that time, uh, there was no longer any uh, respirophasic uh, septal shift. And actually, the pericardial enhancement, uh, quite remarkably, uh, went from at least moderate to now normalized. So to summarize the two cases and uh, uh, compare them, the left side was the first case with the chronic calcific uh, constrictive pericarditis that required radical pericardiectomy surgery to uh, fix the scenario and make the patient feel better, whereas on the right side, it was uh, acute complication initially from the PCI with pericardial effusion and tamponade, and then subsequent to that developing what would be considered trans uh, transient pericardial constriction with inflammation, and the treatment was with medical therapy, anti-inflammatories, uh, to leading to resolution of the inflammation, both uh, biochemically as well as on imaging. So uh, be grateful for our subsequent discussions. Thank you. Okay, Tom, that, that was uh, excellent. Uh, once again, emphasizing the spectrum of, um, of constricted pericarditis. Uh, if you catch it early, it's a transient inflammatory or subacute. Uh, if it's sort of late in the game, it's, it's calcific. Uh, um, Dr. Tong, Michael Tong, maybe to educate us about uh, what's a radical pericardiectomy and um, uh, how's that compared in the, in the community? Uh, what type of pericardiectomies are done elsewhere? Yeah, so if you look at the, the history of uh, pericardectomies over the last 50 years here at the Cleveland Clinic, it started mostly with thoracotomy, left-sided thoracotomy pericardectomies. Um, and over time, it's uh, graduated towards bilateral thoracotomies. Now, um, pericardectomies usually are done um, just phrenic to phrenic anterior pericardectomies. So that would be um, so that that would be the typical pericardectomy that's uh, often described. And we, but we consider that a partial pericardectomy. Um, when we call it what we call a radical pericardectomy, we're also taking out the diaphragmatic pericardium as well as the posterior pericardium. Um, that's uh, that's a posterior to the phrenic nerve, um, anterior to the esophagus, into the spine. And we found that, that the recurrence of pericardial um, constricted pericarditis is much less when uh, when you do a radical. Um, to do a radical now, we prefer our standard approach is the median sternotomy on pump. So we're uh, completing our um, uh, review of our last um, 50 years. Um, which uh, includes about a thousand cases or so, uh, and um, and in summary, essentially, there we didn't find there was any difference in survival whether you go on pump or off pump. Historically, it was always felt that off pump would be better than on pump because you had less of bleeding, you had less effects on the the kidneys and liver. However, we didn't find that there was much of a difference. But what we did find was that there was actually a survival advantage in the patients that had a radical pericardectomy compared to those that just had a partial anterior phrenic to phrenic. So then currently, that's our preferred approach. And if you look at the first case that uh, that Tom, uh, Dr. Wang presented um, with, the, uh, with the severe calcifications, that case would be almost impossible to do off pump. And you really have to, to go on pump to be able to do a complete radical pericardectomy on a case like that. And Michael, I think uh, etiology is very important in the uh, survival, right? Um, depends Absolutely. Depends on what the causes. Absolutely. So we broke our series into three groups. One is the idiopathic and viral group. The second is the post-surgical group, uh, so patients that had a previous open heart surgery. And third is the radiation group. If you just look at the early survival um, or early mortality, the idiopathic group did by far the best. The mortality was around 2%. The post-surgical was around uh, around 8%, but the post-radiation group had a, almost a 
early mortality. So it just shows that um, that etiology t it truly matters when it comes to outcomes. And it's you know, in radiation patients, it's not just constriction that you have, but you have also element of restriction and and um, and a lot of other things going on in that media study. Uh, Tom, I have a question uh, that we really didn't cover, um, uh, and although we're emphasizing the role of advanced imaging, uh, we talked about MRI, PET scan, uh, CT, uh, but um, how do you do a good uh, MRI, a, a pericardial specific MRI? Uh, Tom uh, wrote a paper in CERC Imaging uh, about such a topic, but uh, how would you recommend for the audience, uh, uh, what's a pericardial specific MRI, cardiac MRI? Uh, thanks, Dr. Klein, for the uh, important question. So, um, of course, the uh, cardiac MRI evaluation is very comprehensive for pericardial disease in all areas from the pericardial inflammation to effusion to constriction uh, to mass uh, tissue characterization as well as, uh, you know, congenital anomalies. So um, the, there's sort of a few building blocks in the cardiac MRI protocol that we need to have. We start with, um, as usual, the uh, anatomy delineation, so that includes uh, the black blood sequence. Uh, that's particularly good to look at the pericardial uh, thickness, um, and also combining that with the bright blood sequence, we can help uh, characterize, for example, uh, the fusion content as well as uh, for masses. Um, we want to have the uh, bright blood cine sequences and some of that with free breathing to see how the uh, ventricles interact with each other uh, to look at the heart chamber size and function, um, as well as evaluating constriction on the free breathing sequence. And then most importantly, for especially for pericarditis, we want to have good uh, imaging to look at both uh, pericardial edema, usually on the T2-weighted, such as T2-STIR sequence, um, as well as the LGE or delayed gallium enhancement sequence to look at uh, pericardial enhancement and inflammation. Um, we at Cleveland Clinic generally do the pericardial enhancement sequence with fat suppression because that really helps to distinguish between epicardial fat, which is a common uh, differential diagnosis when looking at this. If it's not adequately fat suppressed, then you may uh, mistaken mistaken that. And also we try to grade the degree of enhancement. So, you know, um, if we just say if it's present or absent, that really doesn't give us as much of a prognostic value and also severity. Whereas if we grade it uh, using semi-quantitative or quantitative methods that we've talked about, then they can tell us, given us an idea of how likely recurrence is going to happen, how likely it's going to respond to therapy, um, as well as duration of therapy. So those are all uh, important parts of at least the minimalistic uh, pericardial uh, MRI. Any comments from the panel, other panelists? Yeah, this was such an excellent case, um, Tom. And I just have one question, a, a different than the ones we've asked to ask about this patient. So he had just been um, revascularized, so he was already on Ticagrelor. How um, important do you think that high-dose aspirin was? And this is a question that I'm constantly dealing with clinically, is the, the risk of, because the patient had an effusion, and so the risk of progression of that effusion when you're adding additional um, antiplatelet at high dose here. And how do you think about that, especially with no acts too, that it really brings in a complicated question? Yeah, so that's a very good question because uh, this case was obviously a high-risk situation from the acute yeah. complication. Um, and I think the main thing here is that we needed something to treat the inflammation because we were thinking that this ha all happened very quickly, the constriction happened very quickly, there's clearly inflammation on the MRI as well as the lab markers. So culture scene alone we feel was not sufficient. Um, and mm -hmm. usually the conventional first line is, NSAIDs plus colchicine, but of course NSAIDs may not be as uh, useful when you have someone, you know, with, you know, in terms of heart issues, whether it's ischemic heart disease or uh, heart failure. So we elected, as the patient was already on low-dose aspirin, to just escalate yeah. that to try and be a, a similar modeling to uh, NSAIDs. Uh, of course, the patient responded very well to this, and th this was good, because uh, if, if uh, he didn't respond well and continue to have inflammation, then we can have a debate about what the next additional option right. would be, whether it's steroid or an IL-1 blocker. If I can continue, um, sorry, Ellen, if I continue on, on, on this, on this line, uh, uh, the, the Brittany open, you know, the, and I heard you, Alan, say that, you know, we try to stay away from steroids. Um, you know, we steroids are are, are still used commonly, uh, not first line, but for second line in patients who fail uh, aspirin or NSAIDs and colchicine. Uh, but of course, we know a lot of the side effects and the contraindication. And you know, the, exactly this patient that Brittany mentioned, you know, dual antiplatelet therapy or the patient who's on uh, oral anticoagulant. 
Um, I'm particularly concerned about putting them on steroids for the risk of GI bleeding uh, or the patient who has heart failure or the patient with diabetes. So um, I wanted to see what the panel um, is doing with these patients. Are, are, are they um, considering steroids anyway uh, for those refractory to the first line or jumping and going to biologics in those? I think that, you know, fortunately, uh, post-MI pericarditis um, is usually not that severe, right? I mean, it, this is a pretty dramatic case, but most cases are fairly mild, and my experience has been you can do okay with col colchicine monotherapy. Um, certainly, things that increase the risk are late presenters or incomplete revascularization, the things that you may think contribute to more of a auto-inflammatory kind of phenotype, or if you have a perforation like this, or you have a complication. Um, you know, I would say, you know, this case also highlights the value of echocardiography at the bedside. Um, it's unusual to have a coronary perf that's not recognized in the cath lab and come to your CCU. Um, so you need to make sure, as Aldo said at the outset, that you're not missing a free wall rupture or some other complication uh, of, of, of an MI. Um, but yeah, I, I think if you need to do something beyond colchicine, uh, I think this moderate to high dose uh, aspirin is okay. But I would, my own practice would be to do a shorter course uh, when the CRP has normalized, uh, when the patient's no longer uh, symptomatic. And certainly I think like some of the very inflamed effusive constrictive cases we've talked about, uh, I think you can make a pathophysiologic or biological argument to use an interleukin-1 blocker uh, in, the, in, those, in those cases. In terms of the um, acute pericarditis, a very common case is acute pericarditis pre presenting with atrial fibrillation, and it's really the pericarditis driving the AFib. Um, we typically do not anticoagulate those patients, and they usually have low chads vas scores, and I find using the direct oral anticoagulants or Coumadin can increase the risk uh, potentially of worsening the effusion. So usually those patients in a different sort of scenario where it's just an acute pericarditis that comes with an atrial tachyarrhythmia, you, you treat the pericarditis and the AFib goes away. And, and, you know, some of those patients do need longer-term monitoring to see if it recurs. Um, but often you don't need to anticoagulate, certainly um, in that acute period. Uh, the only last thing, I know this is like an imaging um, uh, webinar, and it's been fantastic, but I just make a plug. You know, Aldo showed at the beginning, and Tom in one of his cases showed uh, right heart catheterization data. Um, and when these patients do go to the cath lab, I'll just make the plug that we need to make sure we're doing a left heart catheterization and looking for the ventricular interdependence um, that we've been talking about that we can see so well with either echo or MRI. But, we, you know, we get a lot of patients who, uh, as we talked about the pericardial echo, um, you know, with their catheterization, really need to have a complete hemodynamic study, a, a really thorough constriction uh, evaluation for constriction. Uh, I think at this uh, late hour, I think I want to um, thank all the uh, presenters, uh, great cases. Uh, we see the spectrum of uh, pericardus, uh, great panelists. I should mention that uh, um, Jack Imaging and, uh, uh, and the Imaging Council are um, uh, sponsoring a, um, a, um, a consensus statement on pericardial disease. I think um, we should uh, have a guideline on pericardial disease. It's very, very interesting. I think there's a new renaissance. And I want to thank uh, all the presenters. Thank you very much for a great webinar. Thank you.